in the top right of your screen. You should press record. Oh, you don't have to record. No. I'm not, not record. All right. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. We want to welcome you to our Polar Connect event um, that Arcus is hosting here from Fairbanks, Alaska. We're very excited to be talking with uh, Susan Steiner and the team that uh, she's working with up there at Tulick Field Station. She's going to talk all about the uh, Tundra project, and we're going to hear what they've been doing um, since she just got up there a week or so ago. Um, before we turn this over to the uh, Susan and Mike for their presentation, there's a few things that we wanted to let you know about um, using this platform. It's called Blackboard Collaborate, and hopefully um, you should be seeing slides showing up or um, content showing up in the center of your screen, and have a audio um, and video section. The only people that will have video today will be Susan and Mike and the team at Tulip Field Station. Everybody else's video is turned off so that it doesn't ruin everybody's computer system. But you should be able to hear everybody either through the phone or through your computer. There's a list of participants and a chat area where you can type in questions. We will have time for your questions to be asked live and responded to at the end of this presentation. And when we do that, um, you can just click on the little hand icon above the list of participants and that raises your hand and lets us know that you want to um, ask a question. Of course, you can type them in, in the chat room as we're going along. Um, and uh, Mike and Susan and others will try to respond to them as we have time. Um, we would like to know where uh, everybody's coming from. So if you have an opportunity um, and you're, you're joining us by computer, please type in your name, your school, where you're located at. If you've got others in the room with you that are participating today, just uh, use the chat room so we can keep track of where people are joining us and get a sense. Um, sense of participation. Oh, I forgot to mention that this event is being archived and we will post the link on the website. So if for some reason you have to sign off early um, and want to, uh, or need to review it, um, we'll post the link on the Polar Trek website. So about Polar Trek, um, why is Susan up in the Arctic and working out at Tulip Field Station? Well, she's part of a program called uh, Te Polar Trek Teachers and Researchers Exploring and Collaborating. We are funded by the National Science Foundation, thank you, and we have a grant to place teachers um, from around the United States with polar scientists in the Arctic and the Antarctic region so that they can learn more about what's happening up there, get some hands-on science um, experiences and take them back to the classroom. Um, every year we place about 12 teachers six in the Arctic and six in the Antarctic. So lots of expeditions going on right now, so be sure to check out um, the Polar Trek website and uh, see what's happening there. Um, just a real quick refresher about questions. Um, during the presentation, like I said earlier, you can type your question in the chat box, which everybody seems to be doing, figuring that out pretty good. Um, you can also type in any problems you're having along the way. And then also at the end, um, We'll raise your hand and we'll call on you and you can uh, ask your question. And we'll go over this again with uh, questions at the end and how, how the talk feature works. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan and Mike and let you guys take control of the slides. Well, great. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in to our webinar. I'm Susan. and. I'm uh, Mike. This is Mike, and we're here to talk about uh, tundra nutrient seasonality. Um, in this first slide, I just, uh, oh, and another thing I just want to say, um, yes, you can hold your questions to the end, but we're really happy uh, to have a conversation ongoing as we're going through the slides. And uh, if you want to say something and talk about something a little longer, that'd be just fine for us. So we're okay with that. Yeah. So we we really welcome questions during each slide, and we can we'd be happy to just kind of make this more of a conversation than just a seminar. Um, so well, I'll plunge on forward here. The the sign here is Tulick Field Station. We've uh, 
first thing you see when you come into the station, and it's a pretty exciting sign to see, let me tell you, after nine hours driving the Dalton Highway. Um, beautiful highway, lots of scenery, but it's still nice to pull in here, and the realization sinks in that um, Oops, we lost you. You need to click on the talk button again. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. I had moved over to um, run the next slide and uh, mash the talk button by mistake. So this is where we're at, um, Tulick Field Station right here. We drove up from Fairbanks, came along the Dalton Highway. If you guys watch any television at all, you might have seen the Ice Road Truckers. Fortunately, there wasn't any ice on the road except for the couple avalanches that cleared right when we were about uh, in here coming over the Brooks Range. Um, a big important feature of the landscape here is that we crossed the Arctic Circle past the last living tree somewhere around in here, I suppose, and then uh, came across the Brooks Range and headed up to Two Lakes Field Station. Can, can people see the cursor that Susan is pointing with? No, and if, no, and if, and if you want to use the little pointers that you have access to on that little menu. So there's second one down. It looks like a little sun. Yes, you sun. Grab a hand and point with it. Or draw arrows or use pins. But you need to click to make that happen. We won't just see it. Okay. That looks like we can work with that now. All right. So um, moving on down here. Uh, a fun fact about crossing the Arctic Circle is that we now are in 24 hours of daylight. So uh, it's, uh, this is one of the pictures I took that I thought was pretty nice at 3 o'clock in the morning, one morning right from camp. And uh, it's also great to be able to walk around camp in the middle of the night and not need a flashlight. So it makes it kind of handy. The, um, the 24 hours of daylight is also a big factor in the growing season um, length that we'll be talking about later on here. Okay, um, this slide is a couple of really cool logos from uh, the people that run this station. The Institute of Arctic Biology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, they have a really cool logo. Obviously, there's some really neat caribou on it. And then the uh, Two Lake Field Station logo with its loon on there. And uh, I believe, I'm not quite sure, but I believe Two Lake means loon. So we're right here at Loon Lake. We'll go with that for today anyway. That is what it means. All right, good. And I think you have to click on the pointer to make it work. So um, this is a slide of our plots. And uh, you can kind of see um, just this beautiful green tundra setting that we have. The boardwalk's laid out really nice so that we don't trample the tundra while we're um, sampling things. And then in this picture, there's a few um, of our OTCs picture, these six-sided open top chambers, which act as little miniature greenhouses on the tundra. Well, I wanted to introduce you guys. Yeah, right there they are. Thanks. You have to click on this to make it work, Susan. <laughs> you, have to, you have to click down to make it work. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I want to go ahead and introduce you to some of the team members here. Uh, they say it takes a village to, uh, to raise a child. It also takes kind of a village to start and proceed with and finish a research project. So five PIs, um, lead PI Mike here, and I uh, just want you guys to kind of see that it takes, um, takes quite a few folks, research assistants, uh, master students, graduate students, a postdoc, and uh, just a, a whole host of really good folks to get this science to, to work out. So we'll meet a few of them up close here. Uh, last week, Matt Wallenstein was here from Colorado State University. He was helping us a little bit with some of the soil sampling that we were doing. 
and uh, just kind of an all-around great uh, addition to the to the team that we had here. And this is a, a picture of uh, of Mike. Thanks, Mike, for helping me out here. Kind of try and get those icons to work for you. Um, in one of his frostier moments, uh, looking kind of look like Manic of the North here. So uh, that's um, our lead PI, Mike Weintraub, who's sitting right next to me here. Uh, Anthony uh, Derrissett Nardi from the University of Toledo is right here. He came up early in the season to help with the snow melt fabric deployment and uh, is probably busy working right now on the project as we speak um, back in Toledo. So he had to leave a little bit early. He's expecting um, a baby in the family coming up real soon here, so we wish him all the best of luck. Carolyn Livensberger here is um, working with us all through the whole season. She's one of, I think, the only person on the project that's staying the entire field season, and she is the, uh, I call her the queen of phenology. So she has uh, a master of many parts of this project, but her real specialty seems to be with tracking um, the plants as they uh, progress through the season here. Susan, do you want to explain uh, what plant phenology is? Well, I could. Um, plant phenology is basically just looking at the, the bud break of the plants, the, basically the leaf out timing, all the way through the fall when the leaves fall off and senesce. So it's a, a progress of plants. And it's an important thing to look at because as climate changes um, occur, these uh, patterns of plant uh, progression uh, will probably be changing quite a bit. And it's important to take a look at those things. Have anything more to say about that, Mike? Uh, oh, generally, we just think of plant phenology as the timing of plant life history events that we track. And so we track all of the different life history events from greening to flowering to what we call peak season, which is the period when the plants are at maximum greenness to senescence when the leaves start falling. and. Uh, we, we monitor the timing of all of those events individually. Some of them change more than others with changes in climate. All right, well, thanks, Mike. We'll go on with our, um, our team member, Licky Lou, here. This is Caroline Mell, a master's student from Colorado State University. And after our big soil harvesting uh, event that we had the first weekend I was here, uh, right here shows a picture of her busy sorting soil through the tussock soil cores. So uh, I had a, a lot of good help in the lab from her as well as uh, a, a chance to get out and collect uh, some of the soil samples with her that she's using on her master's project. Um, I like this picture right here this, uh, in this area. This is the, um, the soil that we're keeping. So it looks a little different than North Carolina soil or some of that Georgia red clay, Uncle Phil. Uh, but uh, that's what we get here in the tundra. So it's kind of fun to, to really learn a little bit about it. Let me bring that down a little bit more. Thanks. Oh, look, there's a sick sick. Well, he's not really on our team, but um, he helps us out at the research site, says hello to us every day when we come out there. There's a lot of sick sicks here in camp, too. And uh, if you may know them as their other, uh, their other non scientific name, is the Arctic ground squirrel. Last but not least on the team this summer is me, and I actually do get to help out and uh, work with the scientists quite a bit. Uh, this is one of my favorite tasks so far is collecting the micro lysimeter samples. These collect soil water solution um, from the, the soil, and we can look at that soil solution to kind of check out uh, the uh, nutrients that are available to the plants from inside the soil there. Well, that kind of leads us to our, our main question here. What we're looking at today is, what is this research about? Um, as you can see here on the slide, we say the tundra soils are key regulators of many aspects of the Arctic system. They uh, are the drivers of what uh, the plant uh, community may be, which in turn drives uh, some of the atmospheric uh, conditions in the area. The, water runoff that comes um, into the Arctic freshwater systems, uh, the ecosystems in general with the caribou and that sort of thing. So really the soil 
you might say is kind of the root of the uh, of the Arctic system here. So it's a it's a great thing to start with, starting it from from the bottom up. Um, Arctic soils have large stores of carbon, and uh, they may act as a significant uh, CO2 source with warming. So of course that's an important aspect as well. So we we got a question here. What is a microlysimeter measure? Uh, in the chat room. So a microlysimeter is just, it's just a thin little tube. In our case, they are 10 centimeters long by just a few millimeters wide, and it's made of a porous plastic material. We just poke a little hole in the ground with a wire, and then we insert that really narrow little tube in the ground, and we leave it there. And it's got a little piece of tubing sticking off of it that we can use to suck soil water through the porous material of this lysimeter. And uh, you can't really see the lysimeter in this picture. But like I said, it's just a thin little tube that is inserted in the ground with a piece of tubing coming off of it. And we apply a vacuum to that tubing and suck water out of the soil through the tube. And then we can measure nutrient concentrations in that soil water. We actually use a hypodermic needle to draw the, the uh, water out of the little vacuum tubes. So um, there's always kind of that fun challenge of not to, um, to stick yourself while you're out there, too. It's kind of like taking blood from the earth. OK. Um, soil organic carbon. When I first uh, got signed on to this project, I asked Mike, I said, what the heck is all that carbon doing up there anyway in those soils? And so uh, this map is pretty helpful here. You'll see that um, uh, in the circle here is uh, just an idea of how much land mass there is above the equator. And that, um, of course, if there's land mass, that's where your soils are. And the organic carbon that's stored in there tends to stay for a long time up here in these Arctic soils. Um, what happens is, remember, we have our 24 hours of light and our really long growing seasons. And so the growing season and the growth outpaces the rate of decomposition, which allows for then there to be quite a bit of carbon still left and stored in the soil over many thousands of years. That's right. So uh, you know, one, of, one of our big concerns is that with climate change, decomposition rates are going to increase, and some of the soil organic carbon is going to turn into CO2, further elevating atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Well, if we're worried about the decomposition of soil organic carbon, we have to pay attention to where most of the soil organic carbon is. And it happens to be at high northern latitudes for the most part. You don't see it in similar places in high southern latitudes because there's not a lot of land there. It's mostly ocean at similar latitudes down in the southern hemisphere. Uh, at moderate latitudes, like in North Carolina or Georgia, for example, uh, decomposition rates are faster. They're not as limited by cold temperatures in the winter. So you don't get as much of an accumulation as you do up north. Hey, Mike, it looks like we have a question. Can you date the soil? Um, yes, I believe you can. We don't look at that sort of thing. But I believe with carbon um, dating that you can kind of tell how old the soils are. And I'm sure there's research around here on the different layers and the aging of the different layers that there are. That's right. The, the, the soil organic carbon is variable in age. But it often will sit in the ground for hundreds of years or even longer. Once these plants die back and their tissues senesce and hit this cold, often wet ground, it tends to sit there. And a lot of that material just decomposes extremely slowly. And we've had you know, essentially dead plant material accumulating for millennia, if not eons, in this environment. So the next slide, just kind of the big question is, um, is this CO2 going to be um, off-gassed from this soil? Um, and so, and if so, how much, uh, when? And uh, just uh, quite, a, quite a host of questions come from that. And by the way, that's a picture of Tulick Lake there in the uh, foreground. I haven't quite seen it that green yet. It's still actually, people were walking across Tulick Lake yesterday on the ice. So uh, it's not quite that green here just yet. OK, uh, we need to know a little background information about tundra soil processes. 
and there's uh, some terminology that uh, we need to kind of understand and we just need to know a little bit about soil prices in general. So um, nitrogen is the factor that we're, the nutrient that we're really mainly looking at here because um, it is the controlling factor, the limiting factor for plant growth and decomposition in these tundra soils. In this graph here, um, you can see we've got the uh, amount of dry soil um, nitrogen in that soil amounts as you look at time passing through the growing season. Um, you can see the important thing about this is that we've got nitrogen, three different kinds here that we're monitoring, and you can see that there's this uh, kind of crash that occurs right after the peak of the growing season that um, is really an interesting um, part of the main question that we're looking for. Another part of this slide that we'll look at here in a minute is this word tussock. And just to kind of understand the word tussock is kind of helpful in understanding a little bit more about what we're talking about. Did you have something you wanted to add to that, Mike? Well, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what kind of soil we're dealing with, which we call tussock tundra soil. It's a type of tundra environment that we're studying here. But the key take-home message from this graph that Susan was showing you is that there's a very strong seasonal dynamic in nitrogen availability in these soils. Uh, that's something that scientists really haven't previously accounted for. Um, and, you know, who cares? So what that there's this strong seasonal pattern? Well, uh, the issue is that nitrogen availability is really low. The reason why is because a lot of the potentially available nutrients that are in this soil are locked up in all this dead organic matter and are not available for living plants. So uh, these soils are very nutrient limited. And not only is plant growth nutrient limited, but the activity of decomposer microorganisms who do the job of converting this soil organic carbon that we were talking about into CO2, well, that, the activity of those decomposers is also nitrogen limited potentially, but it's probably not nitrogen limited during the early part of the growing season when nitrogen availability is relatively high. But when uh, root biomass reaches its peak and plant nutrient uptake kicks into gear here, there's the potential for CO2 emissions from these soils from decomposition to be limited by nitrogen availability. Well, we have a lot of interest in being able to predict how uh, uh, the carbon balance of Arctic ecosystems and soil CO2 emissions are going to change with climate change. Turns out that we might not be able to make accurate predictions about that unless we account for the possibility that the activity of these decomposer microorganisms might be limited by nutrient availability. And that limitation appears to be changing over the time course of the growing season. So that's what we're trying to understand better. So that, does that make sense? And just feel free to chime in if you have any questions about that. Bring that down a little bit. Let you do that. Well, okay, be thinking, uh, you know, it, um, as you kind of digest that information here. Um, I wanted to go ahead and define a little bit more about uh, what a tussock was because it is such an important factor in our study here. And this is just a beautiful picture of a tussock of uh, tussock cotton grass, area from vaginatum. And uh, you can see, I guess, probably why it's called cotton grass by the blooms here. Uh, this is a, a tussock of, of this stuff. It forms kind of a big bump or hill in the soil with its big, heavy root mass. Um, the roots are, are really great, thick, white roots that are easy to see, and they form this kind of mass of soil as this tussock of uh, sedge grows over the years. Around the tussock is the, uh, the intertussock space, kind of a good name for that, I think. And uh, it's usually pretty moist and, and wet. And this is where you find the little um, willow trees and other little um, uh, really bushes and that sort of thing that grow around the intertussic space. Um, if you were in uh, 
the blueberry pick-in mode, it's in these little intertussic spaces where you find your blueberry bushes. And uh, um, of course, you need to be sort of a, uh, a miniature person about uh, a half a millimeter high in order to be able to really uh, harvest all of this stuff. But uh, the, the tussic, intertussic uh, tundra is just a real important factor and uh, is part of what we look at when we're comparing um, different factors in the study. So I see we have a question here. Uh, what's the difference between tussic tundra and tussic tundra and muskeg? Well, tundra is uh, what you call a biome, a broad region that contains multiple different habitat types and plant communities. Uh, so it's a, like a regional environment or biome, we, we would call it. Um, tussock tundra, also known as moist acidic tundra, is a specific plant community, a group of plants that grow together in certain tundra environments. Muskeg is a different plant community that usually grows in very wet places. Muskeg translates to drunken forest. And it's an environment where it used to be dominated by spruce trees, and all the shading from the spruce trees has inhibited evaporation, and water accumulates in the landscape. Mosses start growing. Water further accumulates. And the trees start falling over because it gets so wet, and it looks like a drunken forest. So that's the muskeg community that occurs usually further south in the boreal forest biome, because in the tundra, there are no trees, so there is no forest of any kind, drunk or sober. <laughs> right, right. We're, we're, we're past that last living tree after uh, the Arctic Circle here. Good question. So what are our research questions? What are we looking for? And uh, first thing is, what causes that seasonal nutrient crash? Remember from the graph earlier where you saw the nitrogen just um, really uh, amounts just go downhill right after, oh, a little bit after the peak of the growing season there. Um, another question is that microbes, since they're the important decomposers and processes of nitrogen, um, are they, is their activity switching seasonally between the carbon and nitrogen limitation? And in another slide or two, um, we'll kind of see and show you what we're meaning by that switch of carbon and nitrogen limitation through the season. Um, the other important question among many, this is uh, just kind of a synopsis and uh, cherry picking almost of the research project. But another important uh, question here is how does the lengthening of the growing season alter the overall ecosystem? as a result um, of this differential extension of the periods. And again, when we see this um, next slide coming up, I think you can see what we mean by the differential extension of these um, limitation periods before and after the crash. So in this slide, um, we're looking at the very top slide, the historical conditions. Um, you can kind of see that um, at, at the onset of snow melt, conditions are fairly limited. Decomposition is limited by um, carbon amounts, okay? As the growing season progresses, there's a, a crash of, of nutrients and things then become nitrogen limited. In this picture, things are kind of like a nice even uh, teeter-totter, uh, fairly well balanced, and this is what um, one would expect is occurring as the season progresses for um, uh, nitrogen amounts in the soil. Did you have something to uh, a couple things I want to point out. First of all, on the, the vertical or y-axis here, and we're looking at nitrogen availability here. So in all of these, we're looking at changes in soil nutrient, particularly nitrogen availability, over time. And this top panel is a graphical representation of the graph that Susan was showing you a couple of slides ago. Well, when there's plenty of nitrogen available, Microbial growth is likely to be limited by the availability of carbon. It's one of the big paradoxes in this environment. There's a lot of soil organic carbon around. So why would microbial growth be limited by carbon availability? Well, the reason why is because that stuff is tough to digest. It's, uh, uh, 
it's sort of been cherry picked by the microbes. All the easy stuff to eat has already been removed by microbial activity, and what's left takes a lot of energy to break down. In order to convert dead plant material into food, microbes have to secrete digestive enzymes into the soil environment. They have to digest their food just like we do, but they don't have a stomach, so they have to secrete their digestive enzymes out in the environment. The tougher the food, the more enzymes are required and maybe the less efficient those enzymes are. It takes nutrients and energy to make those enzymes. Where does that energy come from? It comes from carbon. So you need carbon to get carbon. It's just like you need money to make money, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, the cost of decomposition in terms of enzyme production slows things down and creates this paradox where microbes can actually be carbon limited amidst a sea of plenty. Um, but when nitrogen becomes unavailable after this crash, that can make things even worse because nitrogen is required to make those enzymes. Those enzymes that I was talking about, those are proteins. Proteins are full of nitrogen. Um, and if you don't have enough nitrogen, you can't even make the proteins required for the enzymes to decompose the organic matter, so then you're really stuck. You don't have enough nitrogen to uh, generate that carbon flow that you need to live. So uh, what we've hypothesized here is that early in the growing season when nitrogen, which is generally the most limiting nutrient in this environment, we think, is actually available right after snow melt, well, then that'll make microbes not nitrogen limited, so they're probably carbon limited at that point. But then once that crash in nitrogen availability occurs, they might switch over to nitrogen limitation. So that, that was our thinking when we wrote this proposal. And I hope that makes sense, and please feel free to chime in if it doesn't. Okay, well, yeah, keep, keep. Keep on chiming in uh, by text or however you want to. If you need to uh, use your hand tool to raise your hand in chat, that's great too. Um, these other two drawings here are kind of a synopsis of a couple of the hypotheses. Um, if there is earlier snow melt, you can see that the um, carbon limited period, well, the, the whole carbon limited period time starts a little sooner, although it's pretty much the same length of time as in historical conditions. The big difference here is in the nitrogen um, limited portion of the season and how much more that lengthens. Another hypothesis is if there's earlier snow melt and warmer conditions, again, we've got the, um, the earlier start to the, to the growing season, earlier snow melt, earlier carbon limited, and a much shorter, um, we expect to see, a much shorter um, part of this uh, season as opposed to then the longer tail drawing out of the nitrogen limited part of the season. So these are kind of illustrations of the hypotheses um, of the, the research questions that we're looking at here. Well, this is the part that um, it gets kind of fun is when we're, uh, well, for me, kind of fun. Uh, we're getting to look at the um, length and timing, varying that length and timing of the growing season. Um, by advancing snow melt and warming the soils. These pictures here illustrate the advancing snow melt part of the project. Um, I talked about the postdoc Anthony coming up early to deploy the snow melt fabric. This is a, a lightweight shade cloth fabric that's laid out over the soil and it's just kind of a passive uh, radiation sort of uh, system that allows the, the, the snow to melt earlier, of course, underneath that. Susan, why does putting black fabric over the snow cause it to melt sooner? Oh, that's a great question, Mike. Um, you know what that does is it, um, it absorbs more of the sun's radiation and causes things to, um, to warm up faster. This is one of the, uh, the problems with our Arctic Ocean ice caps melting and that sort of thing as well. As more dark ocean is exposed, it just allows um, more warming to occur in general. And so then you've got kind of a positive feedback effect of uh, warming on top of warming. Uh, Evan, the temps in the summertime. I haven't been here all summer to know how hot it gets. Uh, lately here we've been in the 50s and I think we get up to the 60s. I'm not quite sure what the, uh, 
what the record high temperature is for this area. Do you know, Mike? Uh, the, uh, there, I think there have been times when it's gotten up into the 80s. I don't know what the records are, but uh, it's typically, you know, at this time of year we see, you know, 20s to 60s is kind of the range. Okay, and he's talking, um, yeah, so that, that sounds, um, uh, and we still have that range even though we have the 24 hours of daylight, so it still cools off in the evening some. This other picture, you can just kind of see out on the plot the um, control uh, areas without the snow melt or without the fabric cloth um, versus the fabric cloth treated areas. So varying the length and timing um, of the growing season by advancing snow melt. And then, get to the next slide here, uh, warming the ecosystem. This is uh, the six-sided plastic structure called the open top chambers that you can see here. They're used to warm a section of the tundra in order to study the effects of warming climate. So um, what they do is we've got these um, OTCs and we deploy them in the advanced snow melt sections as well as the sections that weren't treated with fabric. And then on each section of those we have the open top chambers and non-open top chambers where we're monitoring environmental effects. Um, of those chambers and of not having those chambers there. So um, it makes a nice, um, a really nice way to check um, warming in a, a small subset of the ecosystem in that area. So they're essentially just little mini greenhouses that passively warm the tundra. I think while we're here, um, I'll talk about these things. Uh, this little doohickey here is called a mantis array. And on this thing, which looks, uh, it's called a mantis array because it looks kind of like a poised praying mantis ready to, uh, to eat something. And uh, what it does is it's got this nice long arm that um, comes out over into the area. And on the end of it, there's a little uh, a, a kind of a camera. It's actually, I think, a photodiode of some sort that is uh, constantly registering, monitoring the, um, the green up of the tundra down below. This is a great thing that it does rather than us going out there saying, oh, it seems a little greener than it did yesterday. This is a, an actual wavelength sensor that quantifies um, the amount and timing of the green up in a real um, accurate way that we couldn't do. I believe it logs uh, information about every two minutes. At the same time, um, it's got air temperature sensors, soil temperature sensors, um, um, relative humidity sensors, and I'm not sure what else. Soil moisture. Soil moisture. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of taken all sorts of environmental data from this uh, small uh, ecosystem that is um, that it's monitoring right here. Uh, question. Uh, we got a question from Sean. Uh, well, we can't see the northern lights up here in the summer. They are occurring, but because it's 24 hours of sunlight, uh, we don't get to see them. Uh, they are best up here in the fall and spring usually, although you can see them potentially whenever it's dark. And it has to do with solar activity and uh, the solar winds. Uh, we could do a whole different presentation on the northern lights. But um, unfortunately, Susan is not going to be here to see night whatsoever. So <laughs> she won't get to see the northern lights on this trip. And I had the opportunity when I was in Fairbanks for my training in February, but I tended to just not quite make it out at the right time of day to see those. But uh, I know some of our cohorts up there. Uh, I think Melissa and Nick who are tuned in today, I think they also got to see some of the northern lights there in February. Um, so here's a, a, just a, a picture of the tussock tundra. Sarah referred to it earlier. It's like walking across uneven piles of wet laundry. It's just really bumpy and uh, has these, the, the tussock cotton grass that makes the big bumps and then the low spaces of the inner tussock in between. And this is a picture of me hard at work uh, with my first uh, soil core here. And uh, notice I'm uh, pretty well positioned instinctively to not hit my thumb. <laughs> so that's what we're, uh, we're trying to do. We'll be doing another uh, soil um, harvesting session this upcoming weekend. So 
Uh, I'm looking forward to trying out my past experience to see if I can really, uh, really uh, do even better with this sampling session coming up. Oh, did you have something to say? Well, I just wanted to. There's some. There's some stuff here at the bottom. I wasn't sure if you wanted to go through any more of that. Oh, okay. Well, I think uh, I think I might have talked about it a little bit. But again, there's the tussock cotton grass, which is the uh, the bumps, the areophyllum, and then the inner tussock space, the mosses, the lichens, and again the little shrubs like the blueberries, the cranberries, willows, birches. Um, all that, uh, what I kind of like about it is that we talk about the forest here and we can go from the forest floor to the canopy, oh, in probably about 12 inches total if you go to the highest part of the tussock. So uh, it's a little different from the Southern Appalachians forest canopy. Uh, methods that we're trying, uh, that we're using to find out these answers, basically we're looking at really detailed um, time courses of happenings and events on this uh, tundra. We have to, we have, it's a long growing season, but things happen really fast. Uh, it's green up, uh, frost free time of starting maybe really not even until about now um, when the perma, when the uh, active layer is starting to melt a little bit to uh, full senescence, which I believe is in, in August, um, things happen pretty fast. And so we've got a lot of instrumentation out on the plots and we're trying to keep track of, um, of a lot of different things. Again, that big long list of scientists, research associates, grad students, and, and all those folks um, are all specialists in so many different um, aspects of this type of research in chemistry, in soil science, in general ecology. Um, and so so it's, uh, it's, it's really quite a bit of uh, different sort of sampling we're doing. We've got another question here. Uh, wondering if there are big dangers over there like bears and stuff. Oh, that's a good question. We just recently started carrying our bear spray with us. We haven't seen any bears yet, but a bear was spotted in camp about a week ago. Um, so basically we're just uh, looking, keeping our eyes open. I did see a nice fox yesterday over by the plots. Um, but I think our biggest dangers here are going to be more weather related and just uh, keeping safe and keeping um, uh, from hitting our thumbs on the hammers and from sticking ourselves with the lysimeter needles. The bear uh, that was seen, I assume, I don't know what I didn't see it. That would be a brown bear or a grizzly bear. That's mostly what we have around here. And we do have some bears around our sites. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, there were a couple of snow machines that were uh, uh, staged right by uh, the boardwalk that leaves from the road to our sites. And uh, uh, some bears uh, got real interested in them and, and uh, tore out all of the seat foam from the snow machines. So there are some bears in the area and we keep alert and keep careful, but we've never had any negative encounters. Our, our biggest risks are, you know, self-imposed really. Right. And uh, we do work uh, pretty, the plots are nice and quiet. We were working out there the other day and, uh, you know, just happened to look up and a caribou was walking by just kind of munching on some of the tundra. So um, it was pretty cool to get to see that. So I think we're looking more forward to seeing wildlife than we are not seeing wildlife. So I'll let uh, Mike advance that. I'm always worried I'm going to. Okay. Uh, did you want to talk more about how we're trying to, trying to do this? I think I can do that on the next slide because I've got pictures of pretty much all of those types of different uh, collecting assortments that we have here. Um, in this top left picture starting up here, we've got Matt Wallenstein working on uh, hammering out um, a core, soil core, to get uh, the, ham the core coring tool in there to get a nice um, sample of soil. In this picture, we're, uh, again, this is sorting the living matter and the dead matter um, to get to the soil, which is the dead matter stuff. Um, so we um, have these trays, we sort through it, and then we take uh, a number of subsamples from this a uh, sample of soil. You see a little envelope here that we might be going to put some samples of roots in or rhizomes and that sort of thing. We also then weigh out different samples and have different treatments for them. In this picture you can see the, um, the um, what's that thing called? I forgot. I'm having a blank here. Pipette. There we go. The pipette or 
<laughs> to uh, work on some enzyme assays to look at the um, um, the action, remember uh, Mike mentioned that the um, microbes are actively digesting soil organic matter and so the, uh, if we can find out kind of the, how much um, quantity and kind of enzymes that are there then that helps us to, to see how much action is really going on in the soil. In this picture here we've got soil weighed out that's going to go under the, uh, into a, like a We'll uh, kind of have some chloroform applied to these Erlenmeyer flasks and uh, that will essentially kill, again, those poor microbes, they'll kill all those microbes in there and uh, by weighing out those we'll be able to kind of tease out how much of the soil is made up of microbial um, biomass. In this next picture, there's a great slide here, are the vacuettes that we, um, we extract the soil water from and the soil isometers. And so those, uh, again, they do kind of look like, and I think they are actually blood sampling tubes. So uh, that's where we get our soil solution from that we analyze for uh, nutrient content. This next picture, you can see these uh, little beads here. This is the most ingenious little system for marking plants. As I mentioned, Carolyn is the phenology expert here. And these plants that she looks at, she looks at same individual plants. Um, about every other day during this um, early start to the growing season here. And so she is checking individual plants. She's got them marked with a bead uh, kind of code and she checks them again for um, when the buds come out, when the leaves come out, when the flowers come out, um, et cetera. And so she keeps really close tabs on, on those plants in the plots. In this uh, photo, this guy has uh, got this, this white tube here is called a rhizotron and he's inserting a camera down in there. Once the rhizotron thing meets the soil here, the, um, the tube is clear and you can see roots. So you can actively kind of take a look um, at the secret world of roots and what's going on under the soil. So uh, not quite scuba diving, but pretty close. <laughs> um, around here we get to take a whole ecosystem respiration measurement by plopping a chamber on a section of tundra. And uh, that's kind of cool. So we're looking at carbon, um, carbon flux measurements and I'm sure, are there other atmospheric gases we're testing there? Yeah, we're just looking at CO2 with that one. Okay, so um, these respiration chambers, we've not uh, deployed those yet. I assume we're waiting until full green out for those. I and, think we're just uh, waiting for the personnel to arrive. Oh, okay, good. So um, that'll be kind of a, a really interesting aspect of the, of the project to look at CO2 amounts in the atmospheric um, area right above the, the especially the warming chambers and the non-warming area. This is a picture of Carolyn again, um, uh, getting the hobo data loggers set up to, to um, collect their data again every two minutes. They take uh, readings of different environmental conditions in the plots. So it's pretty important to keep up with those and get that uh, data downloaded regularly and make sure that um, the loggers are working all the time because uh, you wouldn't want to miss anything because things, again, do happen pretty fast. So there's, there's a couple questions. Evan wants to know what you do in your free time. Do I give you any free time? Well, Evan, <laughs> I've had some free time and I'll tell you what, the other day we went on a great hike. We went on this mountain that's just, you can see it from the camp. It looks, it's called Jade Mountain. Uh, doesn't, uh, it looks just like a, a kind of a nice pretty green hillside with some rocks, but uh, again looks are deceiving. It turned out to be a little steep for me because I think I've been hitting the dining hall a little too much. <laughs> um, but uh, the views were fantastic from it. There were some, there were some hidden uh, glacial lakes up there and uh, it was just beautiful. So there's hiking to do around here. There's mountain bikes you can borrow from the camp and go for a ride. You can always find somebody to go for a walk around the lake with. I like to go bird watching myself. So, yeah, we're, we're having uh, no trouble filling in the, uh, the free time here. And let's see what the other question is. A square foot of tundra that you have, it's been in your freezer. If we put it outside, do you think it will start to grow? Well, I don't know what to think about that. I'd sure put it outside and take a look. Of course, if you want to keep it pristine, you may have to cut it in half and keep half of it in your freezer just in case you need some backup data for what happens. That might be what I would do. Eventually, what uh, uh, will probably happen to that little patch of tundra if you put it outside is that 
it's going to um, uh, it's going to wind up getting a little uncomfortable. It's going to get a little warm, and uh, those plants might wind up experiencing high temperature stress. But there's probably a lot of organic matter in that chunk of tundra that surely will decompose as long as it's kept kept wet enough for the microbes in there to survive. But it could be, you know, it's certainly not going to turn into like an invasive plant problem. So, <laughs> uh, Give it yeah, a shot. Exactly. Take a look. Well, um, we should talk just a bit about the results that we've seen and uh, kind of, I see we're, we're down to a little bit of time left so we want to keep moving here. Um, results being seen, this is a great interesting graph of uh, temperatures in a tussock tundra plot where shade cloth was deployed and shade cloth is not deployed. The red is the accelerated shade cloth areas, the black is the control non-shade cloth areas. And uh, with the snow on, the uh, shade cloth is, is deployed at this point around April 15th. Um, no, I'm sorry. That's just when temperatures are starting to be taken. Um, when the shade cloth comes out, boy, you see a real quick rise in the ground temperatures there up to zero. Zero degrees Celsius is freezing, or we might say thawing. And so at this point then, um, you've got the snow starting to melt, and you see how um, the temperatures then are going to change through nighttime and daytime through a couple of different uh, weeks of time period going on. At this point then here you see the control plots also reach that critical zero degrees melting point. The snow starts to melt and about five or so, maybe ten days later, you see that the temperatures on both uh, accelerated and control plots then match up pretty nicely. So we're seeing that we've accelerated snowmelt in 2011 by 15 days. And accelerating snowmelt was one of the goals of the project to see um, what effects that had on the tundra soils. Yeah, really what we're, what we're trying to do with the snowmelt acceleration is not, not mimic a future climate necessarily. We're not saying this is realistic for what's going to happen in the future. But we're trying to push around the timing of plant growth to see if we can push around the timing of that nutrient crash. Basically, we have a correlative pattern from our previous research, and we are trying to push around the timing of plant growth to establish causality. We think that the timing of that nutrient crash has to do with root growth and root biomass. Well, the way to determine that for sure is to move the timing of root growth and root biomass and see what happens to the timing of that crash. Yes, indeed. So, um, look at this root growth. This is a great meaty couple of graphs here. Um, but a couple of the important things here is that we're looking at root production rate um, over time period correlated with the date of snow melt. In this accelerated snow melt plot where the fabric was put on the snow to melt it, here the snow melted like May the 6th. Over here is images of root biomass um, that came out of this plot. So you can kind of see this amount of root biomass as opposed to this amount of root biomass in the ambient or control snow melt plot. The data snow melt was much later, but we had much more overall root biomass. Well, that's cool. I heard once that someone said, well, one of the greatest things a scientist can say is, wow, that's funny. That's not what I expected. And sure enough, this is not what we expected. You would think with accelerated snow melt, you'd have more root biomass, things would be really going to town. But it turned out that the exact opposite uh, was kind of true. So we're going to wonder about that. Oh. Well, and, uh, like here. well, so what are these wiggly lines up here? The wiggly lines are <laughs> root production rate. Nope. Nope. Yeah. The temperatures. Okay. Soil temperatures. These are just soil soil temperature. This uh, these these lines. This red and green line. This is soil temperature. The red line is in tussock soil, and the green line is in intertussock soil. And this is just soil temperature in our accelerated snow melt plots up above and soil temperature in our uh, control or ambient plots below. Uh, 
The green line again is intertussic, the red line is tussic. Because the intertussic soils are wetter, their temperature is more stable because of that thermal inertia of water because of its high specific heat. Um, and what we're looking at here in these lines is not actually total root biomass, but root production rate. So it's growth rates. But what you can see really, the key point is that in our accelerated snowmelt plots, there's a long delay between the date of snowmelt and the onset of root production. In our control plots, there was essentially no delay. And that was a very surprising result. That was really the opposite of what we predicted. Good stuff. So going on, what does this finding mean? Um, well, accelerated snowmelt, like you said, resulted in the delayed and reduced the root growth in the tussock tundra. Um, the thought on this uh, is that we think it's due to low temperature stress after the snow is gone. The snow is an insulator on the plants there in the tundra and the soil itself. And so once it's gone, the, the, everything's exposed to the weather. And um, I think in that other graph you could see that there was some uh, variation in temperature quite a bit after the, the snow was melted. And so, of course, uh, if you put your tomatoes out too soon and the frost gets them, there you go. You don't have any tomatoes the rest of the season unless you run back to town and buy some more. So um, we think that the low temperature stress um, may have really affected the plant growth in that case. And how do we? And 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 what's a, what's a piece of evidence that helps us uh, identify that cause? Well, we we uh, identify the cause. I'm not quite sure what you're saying here. Well, so uh, one of the things that lets us know that it was low temperature stress. Uh, in our accelerated snowmelt plots is that when we combine that with warming, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of warming totally changed that pattern. So that is a little piece of evidence that maybe low temperature stress in our accelerated snowmelt plots was causing this, this delay in root growth. Okay. So any changes, but you know, what this says is that climate changes can impact root growth and, you know, we think that changes in root growth are likely to alter nutrient availability, microbial activity, and maybe even decomposition rates by influencing nutrient availability. Okay, well, it looks like um, we're going to kind of wrap up our portion and let you guys um, go ahead and ask those questions that you've had. Um, you've been so polite and holding on to them, but just go ahead and fire away now. Um, looks like uh, we're going to have a few minutes. so. Um, by the way, this is a picture okay, right. of the boardwalk heading into the into the sunset, it looks like. So you had one question from Sandy yeah, up above about what birds you're seeing. About the birds that we're seeing, right? And uh, of course my exciting, most exciting bird sighting so far is the Arctic turn because that was what I really wanted to come up here and see. Uh, thanks to Dr. Hoxley back in college that kind of got me turned on to those. Um, they hover over the lake here all the time, so they're um, they're a pretty uh, good sighting. The other bird that I see a lot of out on the plot is the Lapland longspur, which not only has a cool name, but it's just a, a neat little sparrow kind of bird that I enjoy um, enjoy watching. They kind of there's a pair that uh, nests on the plot, and they just kind of flit around talking to each other all day long while we're out there. We got lots of long-tailed Jaegers flying around at our yeah, site. That's right. Those are really cool. Northern Harriers. Um, white crown sparrows are out there, and there's a lot of lakes in this environment, and we've got waterfowl from all over the world here. It's really, uh, there's so many birds. We could spend hours just talking about the birding up here. Okay, well, it looks like we got another question from Principal Gibbs here, um, talking about the soil density and the samples that we take. How deep? Well, um, it varies. We're trying to get into um, the soil far enough to get a good uh, representative sample of the soil organic matter without getting so deep that we end up with the, the mineral soil that's really um, not of interest to us at this time. Um, and I think in my experience, being the experienced soil core that I am, um, it's about as deep as I want to go because my little hands get tired and my arms get tired of hammering that <laughs> core in there. So yeah, we're focused on the essentially surface accumulations of organic matter in these soils and we are sampling uh, usually the, the top 10 centimeters of what we call the organic soil where there's that thick accumulation of soil organic matter 
and we are not focusing on deeper mineral soils. There's lots of interesting questions that relate to deeper soils in this system, but we can only work on one thing at a time. Yep, and that's, that's plenty. It seems like we're working on a lot at once as it is. Other questions, you guys? Great. Good. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I saw your comment about the class. Um, I'm enjoying you guys being uh, participants as well. We'll have another assignment soon. Homework. <laughs> Uh, we got a question about where uh, the link could be found for the archive of this webinar, webinar Sarah and Janet. Oh, there it is. It will be posted on the Polar Trek website. So stay tuned to Susan's Polar Trek page for a link. Yeah, you guys, and keep following those journals. And uh, if we can page down here, there's a little picture of me waving at you guys all. So we'll put that up. Hey, look, it's me. All right, you guys, having a good time up here at Tulick Field Station. <laughs> and that's Susan on top of Jade Mountain right there. Let me turn it on. Go ahead. Hi, so we wanted to see if anybody is uh, wanting to ask their questions live or just talk to you, but it looks like a lot of people are signing off, so they're saying thanks, enjoyed, have fun, nice photo, great job, bye Team Spider, bye Betsy. <laughs> so if you want to um, say something to Mike and Susan, you're welcome to um, press the little hand button and we can call on you, but I think most people are signing off. so. Um, Thank you guys for uh, your time. It was great to uh, hear what you're all doing. And I'll turn the mic back over to you. Thank you all for y'all for signing in. Uh, thanks, Mike, for helping out uh, really uh, with this presentation. And I'm looking forward to keep learning more and more about this as the summer uh, goes, goes on.